Good morning, uh, everybody. Let me introduce our fifth uh, session of the uh, of the Europe in the World Forum lectures, uh, and which is the fifth of this year, the end, the last of this year, and uh, we will start restart again next year on February the first, Monday, with uh, Professor uh, Wim or Wim Blockmans. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce you, Professor Dirk Moses, though I think it is a pleasure which is not necessary, at least for you, because you all know him very well. Uh, Dirk is uh, our colleague in our department since uh, last uh, January, so he's now close to be here one year. I hope he will remain for many years. And uh, he, as you know, is professor of global and colonial colonial history in our in our department. Dirk was born not so many years ago in Australia, and uh, he wrote his his PhD thesis in Berkeley, and then he became professor also in University of Sydney in, in Australia. He's a very prominent specialist on genocide and Holocaust, and he presented to be selected here a very interesting project which put in a global perspective this uh, phenomenon. Uh, if uh, you want to know him even better than uh, what I'm going to explain here, I would recommend you to go to our website and go into his own personal uh, web page in which, apart from seeing a very beautiful page, you will see a very good description of our colleague where you will find all the merits that I can, uh, I need to summarize here very briefly. I mean, I would say that, uh, as I said, uh, Dirk is a very prominent specialist on genocide. He's the author of Empire, Colony, Genocide, Conquest, Occupation, and Sovereign, Sovereign Resistance in World History. He belongs to the board of very important international journals, and he is, he is now the editor of Oxford History of Genocide Studies. So I think that uh, this summarizes very well what Dirk is doing here in our department. And uh, I hope he will be, uh, uh, and he's uh, also a member of the committee for the Europe in the World Forum, which means that I really appreciate his desire to present also here his uh, ideas, because I think that being a member of the committee, this is a double supportive to the tasks of the Europe in the World Forum, the participation on these uh, lectures. We also have, as discussion, Alana O'Malley, who is also very well known for many of us. She's a fourth year student, researcher. She is about finishing her thesis, consequently. And she is doing her thesis with uh, our colleague, uh, Professor Kiran Patel, on Anglo-American relations and the Congo negotiations. I think I know her also very well because he has attended several seminars that I gave with Professor uh, Kiran Patel. And I'm sure we will have also a very stimulating and interesting discussion of the paper of uh, Dirk. And Dirk, you have the floor, 35, 30, 30, 35 minutes. And then we will pass to Alana with 15 minutes, Alana. Okay. Thanks very much uh, for the generous introduction, Bartolome. Now, since I'm relatively new here, and this is my first paper addressed to the department as a whole, and because this is also the paper's first outing, it was written in haste over the last few days and is very much a rough draft, I will begin with some background, which will make for a rather long introduction, I'm afraid. Now, I've been interested in the partitions of the 1940s, Germany, India, in Palestine for a number of years now, hosting a workshop on the topic in Sydney in 2009, but never having found the time to put pen to paper, let alone engage in the very broad reading required 
to say something new or interesting. I can't yet claim to have done sufficient reading, but some of us have made a start in our seminar on the partitions of Europe, India and Palestine that is running this semester. My interest has been driven by a number of discrete questions that converge felicitously or perhaps fatefully in the 1940s, and some of which will come up today. The origins of forced population movements, often called ethnic cleansing. The geopolitical reorganization of the Indian subcontinent and the Middle East. The enduring appeal of ethno-nationalist movements and associated political emotions. Decolonization in the end of empire and the foundation of the post-war human rights regime, which of course includes the Convention on the Punishment and Prevention of Genocide in 1948. Basically, in other words, the nature of the international order over the past 60 years or so. To date, I've tried to answer these questions in modest ways by writing about West German intellectuals and the reconfiguration of German national subjectivities, about memory and history wars and global perspective, on indigenous debates about collective identity, about Raphael Lemkin, the Polish Jewish lawyer who coined the genocide term, and about genocide in colonial contexts like Australia, where indigenous peoples suffered for the advancement of modern civilization, or if you like, for the sake of Europe and the world. Having indigenous colleagues is a surefire means to shake, one, shake you out of your Eurocentrism. In doing so, colleagues have often asked me over the years whether genocide is really a scientific or scholarly term, like, say, state, society or revolution, which is what they study, and not more of a polemical or at least moralistically loaded term. There are two answers to this question. The first is that these other terms are really not so neutral as often supposed. They're indentured, after all, to a modern political imaginary and entail revolutionary ruptures in cultures without states and without distinctions between Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft. The second answer is to embrace the normativity the undeniable normativity of the genocide concept as a means to interrogate the global order from different perspectives. Precisely because it is invested with emotional intensity, because members of smaller nations and peoples in particular transact their identities in part by claiming to be victims of genocide, the term illuminates affective dimensions of power politics that are concealed by restricting our focus to the great powers and international organizations. What is more, the genocide concept's legal institutionalization and subsequent career at the UN and in public discourse functions as a barometer of what has been called the standard of civilization in international society. Because the UN General Assembly said of genocide in 1946 that it, quote, shocks the conscience of mankind, unquote. It was constructed as the threshold of humanitarian criminality. Barbarians and savages committed genocide, not civilized people. That's what's entailed in the term shocking the conscience of mankind. It is then up to historians to denaturalize these categories by showing how the shock and the conscience of mankind, these concepts, were negotiated in the 1940s and since. For clearly they have changed over the years and were contested all along. By studying how genocide is constructed and invoked, we can ask questions about symbols and power, that is, who gets to establish the threshold of what is truly shocking in humanitarian terms. This is the context of my interest in partitions. The closer I look, the more apparent it becomes that partition is one of the geopolitical key words of the last 150 years or so. Indeed, perhaps since the three partitions of Poland in the second half of the 18th century. So many aspects of global governance, a key word at this institution, are revealed by its various modalities. And so many of the world's conflicts today have their roots in one partition or another. Consider the fraught negotiations and or relations in Ireland, Bosnia, Cyprus, North and South Korea, Mahmoud Abbas's recent statement that the Palestinians should have accepted the UN partition plan in 1947, the simmering tensions within Pakistan and between it and India, and of course the partition of Sudan in two states just in July this year. At this moment, Kosovo and Serbia are wrangling over their unofficial border as nationalists on both sides decry a possible partition of Serbia and or Kosovo. <laughs> 
Germany is still dealing with the consequences of its partition after the war. Just as one might suggest, Africa is suffering the consequences of its partition by European powers in the 1880s. Partition was the term used at the time in the 80s and 1880s and 90s and since as a correlate for the infamous scramble for Africa. Now these are the obvious cases, but many others which are submerged from view offer key insights into current affairs. China just avoided partition by the great powers around 1900 and Persia between Britain and Russia just a few years later. Their close brush with dismemberment needs to be borne in mind when assessing their allergic reactions to Western criticism. The same applies to Turkey, whose nascent military forces successfully resisted partition of the core Ottoman lands, reversing the 1920 Treaty of Sevres at the expense of the Kurds and Armenians, with well-known effects. Kurdistan is now divided between Turkey and the neighboring states of Iraq, Syria, and Iran, and efforts to liberate the Kurds have led to violent insurgencies and genocidal counterinsurgencies in two of those countries. For its part, the cradle of Armenia lies now in eastern Anatolia, that is, in eastern Turkey, with its rump surviving as a small southern Caucasian state. At least, that's how the Armenian nationalists see matters. Syrian Arab elites were not so lucky. Unable to withstand the French occupation of Damascus in 1919, their dream of a greater Syria was strangled at birth when Palestine, Transjordan, and later Lebanon were carved out of their expected territory. Showing how, the long, how long the fear of dismemberment by great powers has haunted so-called non-historical peoples, they, the Syrian uh, nationalist elites, invoked the partition of Poland in 1920 as a terrible precedent, and they called for US rather than French mandate control over their region. Perhaps the Syrian invocation of the Polish example can be called a transfer, uh, as could the reference to Polish blood in the Italian national anthem. More recently, in the 1970s, the South African apartheid regime's Bantustan policy was referred to as partition. Um, while earlier the French had considered partitioning Algeria to protect uh, the European enclave in Algeria and around the coast. Until 1997, Samoa was called Western Samoa because its eastern parts remain in American hands, partitioned with Germany in 1899. A few years later, at the same moment of European expansion, Imperial Germany was also involved, involved in subdividing Cameroon with the French and also conceding to France's partition of Morocco. Now, the urge to partition is not confined to the distant days of pre-World War I colonialism. Not long ago, in 2007, some US commentators and politicians thought Iraq would be better off if partitioned into three regions. And now there's talk of partitioning Ukraine to appease its Russian population, to effect the equivalent of the Transnistrian secession from Moldova in 1990, or the secession of Nagorno-Karabakh from Azerbaijan. How many of us, except perhaps Steve Smith and his students, know or have asked ourselves why there are two Mongolias, one an independent republic, the other known as Inner Mongolia, an autonomous region in the People's Republic of China. These are the cases I've come across in my reading, but there are surely more, casting doubt on Charles Mayer's contention in 2000 that the age of globalization had replaced the age of territoriality, which commenced, he says, roughly around 1860 and ended in the 1970s. Now, historians have contributed little, I think, to the study of partitions as a general strategy of global governance. This has been the preserve of political scientists and political geographers who perforce tend to rely on monographic work of historians who are the experts in particular cases. Of course, there's masses of literature on the partition of India and so forth, but not much at a comparative or theoretical historical level. Although this picture is slowly changing as transnational and comparative historical perspectives gain traction, we are still talking about a handful of comparative historians at most. The field is wide open for novices like me to venture generalizations based on reading across time and space. Ever cautious, though, we historians tend not to posit general theories about historical process or events, including partitions. Often the differences are more important than the similarities between various cases, even with temporally adjacent events like the partitions of Pal Pakistan, or rather India, and Palestine. 
We work ideographically rather than nomothetically. I, for one, however, regard as intellectual defeatism the Rankian preoccupation with the particular over the general, as if broader patterns, recurring themes, and the influences of historical and current learning processes cannot be observed, if only because it abandons the field to the political scientists and their, sorts, their search for law-like tendencies. As I have mentioned, the academic study of partitions is dominated by political scientists who are often close to government and policy development. They are part of the official mind, and for that reason alone, it's necessary to address their approach briefly here. Laying bare its limitations is also a necessary precursor to a reflexive historical treatment of the subject. Summed up most briefly, the contemporary political science literature which emerged in the late 1990s after the Yugoslav Wars of Succession, presupposes the existence of ethnic or national groups with hardened identities, which live in compacted zones of commingled settlement that are vulnerable to inter nissine conflicts due to the fatal logic of what they call security dilemmas, the cycle of violence unleashed when the maintenance of security for one group is interpreted or experienced as aggression by the neighboring one. The realists, as they are called, like Jack Mearsheimer and Chaim Kaufmann, call for new borders and compulsory population transfers in seemingly intractable ethnic conflicts. And they call this the least worst options for global governance, much as British policymakers did when they entreated partition and transfer in the Peel Commission report about Palestine in 1937. Opposing them are other political scientists like Radha Kumar, who doubt whether partitions and compulsory population transfers achieve the claimed social and interstate peace. In fact, she argues, creating new borders can provoke the very violence that partition is designed to prevent. Moreover, they then lead to paranoid political cultures we witness in the Middle East and South Asia, and perhaps in the Balkans. Showing the policy proximity of this literature, she even has a website, which is behind me online there, sponsored by the Council of Foreign Relations, the UN, all these um, are on the side here, the sponsors, the UN, the Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Ford and Rockefeller Foundations, even National Geographic, setting out the arguments for and against. Here it is, the partitions debate, and she even has a nice little graph, as the political scientists like to do, pro and con, setting out the arguments for and against uh, partitions and presenting arguments uh, information for those who need a quick briefing on the subject. If you read this carefully, you can see this is actually meant for policymakers who want to get a quick, a quick take on these very simple historical problems uh, we see in the Balkans, uh, South Asia, the Middle East, North Africa, um, and other parts of the world. Uh, and this is just called partitionsconflict.com. You can surf through this if you want. Now, to the historian's ear, this literature, whether for or against partitions, takes far too much for granted. Ethnic and national groups are invested with ontological status as the primary, even sole, significant political actors, and as the primary and even sole source of individual identification in parts of the world where political subjectivities were far more porous and certainly not determined by religion alone. Like Lord Curzon, they presume that peoples are mixed and that they need to be unmixed, or if not, then at least properly governed or supervised by Westerners. All too often, these authors proceed as if 30 years of constructivist sociology and historiography about nations and nationalism had never been written. What's more, the policy discourse is indentured to a managerial gaze of solving, in inverted commas, the problems of non-Western peoples, a neo-imperial neo subject position that in many cases led to the problems in the first place. An obvious feature of the literature is that it presumes the ethnic conflict it seeks to resolve, rather than explaining how they came about, a question that would entail some reflexivity about the observational and interventionist subject position that it's assumed. For the creation of seemingly intractable and irreconcilable tensions were often the products of imperial strategies of imperial governance. How did those Indians end up in Fiji, Tamils in Sri Lanka, Zionists in Palestine, and much earlier, the Protestants in Ireland, to name a few cases. Finally, the for or against discussion, which is what you see on this website, 
whether to separate groups or enjoin consocial arrangements of cantonization, federalization, and so forth, presupposes that a right answer, a final solution to a nationality problem, above all when a given nation is safely housed in a state, is possible in the first place. Here, Switzerland and sometimes Belgium are noted as exceptions that prove the rule, which is set by the so-called artificial states of Africa, or say Sri Lanka, a fertile example for partitionists who might argue that it had been better off partitioned rather than suffer the brutal civil war which only just ended with outrageous civilian casualties perpetrated by both sides. As we can see then, two levels of analysis must be distinguished and related. On the one hand, we have the language of partition invoked by nationalists who cry out when their country is dismembered, it's a term they use, which presumes, presumes a body, dismembered by neighbors and or great powers. On the other hand, we have the language of academic analysis that buys into these assumptions. Now, the issue I'm driving at, which is ignored by the conventional literature, is the nationalist political imaginary that informs and frames our limited discussion of these problems. The term partitions presumes a natural whole that is dismembered by an outside power, as in the partition of Poland or of Africa or of Turkey, to name some of the book titles I've seen published over the last 140 years. The term is part and parcel of, part and parcel of a modern geopolitical vocabulary like self-determination and secession that again presumes the existence of peoples and nations as given entities and as the chief actors in history. Not for nothing are secession and partition often linked and even used for the same event, depending on perspective. For many Moldovans, the secession of Transnistria is in fact a partition orchestrated by the wicked Russians. And for this reason, it's impossible for someone, I think, who is effectively committed to nationness, let alone nationalist, to write sensibly about partition. As historians, however, we are aware of the contingency of ethnogenesis and the indeterminacy of identity. The evidence I've read, and some of which I'll share with you shortly, suggests that far from some solving identity dilemmas, partitions represent another chapter in the endless process of their reconfiguration and adaption. Rather than engaging in the separation of homogeneous peoples, partitions are a modality of their making, however fraught and incomplete, indeed impossible. Hence the title of this paper, that is, Partitions in the Making of Peoples, which is intended ironically, because I don't really think they do make peoples. For nationalists, for nationalists imagined that partitions led to the territorialization of their people, its return to history, that is, collective agency in time. But what the last 60 years have revealed is the Sisyphean nature of realizing the national fantasy in practice. The partitions of the 1940s, then, I want to suggest, were not only temporally limited events, but founded enduring structures, to borrow a term from Patrick Wolfe's work on settler colonialism, which says settler colonialism is not an event, but a structure, which inserted a repetition compulsion into the architecture of these states' foundations. By presuming fantasized homelands for declared nations, the Pakistani nation, the Indian nation, the Jewish nation, and so forth, the terms of discussion, whether for or against Pakistan, or partition rather, load, load the state dice as culturally homogeneous, with or without minorities, rather than as spaces of plural political subjectivities. And that's why over the, la over the last uh, few generations, 400 Palestinian villages have been wiped out in Israel, just as the architectural legacies of Jewish cultures have been erased in Ukraine, as Omer Batov has been showing recently, just as Hindu civilization is effaced in Pakistan and parts of India doing their best to forget about the Muslim past there. And I'll elaborate shortly on these processes. For now, I want to stress that I don't propose answers to the problems of mixed populations, because such an effort is necessarily futile and misses the point entirely. We need to understand the conditions of possibility for this framing of human organization at all. As a preliminary step, I explore the modern political imaginary less by constructing models of partition or identifying variables of its success or failure, as we see in these kind of websites, which reflects this political science literature, 
um, than instead by situating the partitions of the 1940s in time and space. That is, as moments in the modern history of people making, or at least in the attempt. What they reveal, as I've suggested, is that at the very least, the identity dilemmas brushed over by the conventional political science approaches are deferred and metastasized after partition. What the Indian historian Ranabir Sanbaba calls partition's molecular logic, as in uh, its uh, units of analysis, uh, the tendency to break down identity into basic units, whether neighborhood, villages, cities, communities, families, gender, and parties, is plain to see in Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Israel, and Germany, where all these societies began with, well, leaving Germany out of this for the moment, but with these other cases, where, where all these societies began with national secular projects, although contestably in Pakistan's case, the inner logic of ethnocracy or theocracy, uh, more suppressed in India and, and in Israel, less so in Pakistan, has begun to assert itself sooner or later just as rival particularisms have articulated themselves internally to challenge the homogenizing logic of the partition ideology. What I'll be showing now then is that partition structuring effect rather than event-like nature has been played out in memory and identity across a number of domains. Needless to say, there can be no question of conveying much empirical detail in a short paper. Uh, the full-length paper, of which I'm not giving to you today, is somewhat longer let alone narrative accounts of German, Indian, and Palestine partitions, especially after this protracted conceptual throat clearing. I'm not proposing an exercise in conventional comparative history. What I present are examples of the recurring molecular logics from South Asia in the second half of the 20th century. I briefly begin, or bring in the German and Palestine cases in the conclusion. I begin, though, with the exclusion of cultural genocide and forced population movements from international society's threshold of humanitarian transgression. Because the readiness with which partition and associated population exchanges and expulsions were countenanced in the 1940s not only affords insight into the basic assumptions of the international order that we still inhabit, but also reveals how European, Indian and Palestinian cases became entangled. So this section, this next section, uh, proceeds more or less in narrative mode, and it's about the UN, the 1940s, and the partition debates, and the debates about genocide in relation to cultural genocide and forced population movements. Now, much attention has been devoted of late to the interwar international order's framing of the so-called minority problem. On the one hand, condoning massive population transfers, which were all very violent, like the Turkish-Greek exchange in 1923, and on the other, protecting minorities in Central and Eastern Europe with League of Nations treaties to that effect. Now, the perception that German minorities in Poland, and especially Czechoslovakia, played destructively destabilizing roles in undermining those countries' sovereignty by acting as proxies for Nazi Germany discredited minority protection in the Western official mind in the 1940s. Minorities were not mentioned as an object of protection in the founding documents of the UN, which declared itself for individual human rights instead. To be sure, the, Wils the Wilsonian language of self-determination continued as a normative basis of international order, but it was now applied to peoples rather than nations, again underlining the move away from sub-national group rights. Because Nazism was interpreted as an aggressively expansionist nationalism, border stability and security were now the priorities rather than international justice to which the League of Nations was at least rhetorically committed. And because European minorities were seen as a source of instability, they could be transferred. Referring to the 1923 Lausanne Agreement on which the Turkish-Greek population exchange was based, the British Prime Minister uh, Churchill called for a clean sweep, his term, a clean sweep of Germans from Poland in late 1944. And the British Foreign Office insisted that, ethnic, that all ethnic Germans, and not just the guilty ones, be expelled from Czechoslovakia. And they agreed with Edward Benez, the leader of the Czechoslovak government in exile, who wanted to drive out the three million Bohemian Germans and exchange ethnic Hungarians with Slovaks living in Hungary. Now, this was an instance of plain demographic homogenization based on 
uh, the reversion to 1937 borders. Massive population movements attended Soviet, American, and British agreements to new European borders in 1944 meetings at Yalta and Potsdam. After entertaining plans to partition Germany, they resolved to move Poland westwards at Germany's expense, leading to the transfer of hundreds of thousands of Poles to replace the Germans. I'm not going to put up maps, but we covered this in my seminar. The consequence of shifting Poland westwards, or Ukraine westwards as well, also entailed the shifting of tens of thousands of Ukraines and Poles. All the Germans were to leave uh, those and other Eastern European countries, in all about 12 million. The rump of Germany was then divided into four occupation zones that, after the commencement of the Cold War, congealed into the partitioned East and West Germany we're familiar with from the post-war period. For nationalists, however, German nationalists, referring to the country's 1937 borders, Germany's actual East was not East Germany, that was Middle Germany. Germany's actual East lay in Russia and Poland, which were, had annexed those parts of Germany. By all accounts, the Western allies were genuinely appalled by the violence that attended the expulsion of the Germans, which took uh, at least half a million lives. Sometimes it's claimed two million, but that's probably too many. The British uh, Jewish publisher, Victor Golanch, who had agitated during the war to save, for the allies to save Jewish lives, so he was very much a humanitarian activist, uh, wrote of these, these deportations, and I quote him, if the conscience of mankind had ever become sensitive, these expulsions will be remembered to the undying shame of all those who committed and connived at them. The Germans were expelled not just with an absence of overnice consideration, but with a very maximum of brutality, unquote. So the population expulsions of Germany's partitions, uh, of the partition of Germany, violated civilized norms, at least for him. But for all that, when the definition of genocide was debated at the UN in 1947 and 48, so basically at the time of these, uh, at the end point of these, of these population expulsions, the UN Secretariat and the Western powers did their utmost to exclude cultural genocide and population expulsion from the projected convention. These were held not to shock the conscience of mankind. Only mass killing, which was mostly referred to as physical destruction, was uh, something that shocked the conscience of mankind for the Western powers and the UN Secretariat. They associated uh, physical destruction with the Nazi regime, although the Nazis were also being prosecuted for deporting civilians en masse, which was at least categorized as a crime against humanity at the later Nuremberg trials. The dominant view was that minority protection was not the task of the Genocide Convention, which limited itself, therefore, to physical destruction on the whole, and excluded cultural genocide, which was seen as uh, protecting minorities, preventing assimilation. If minorities were to disappear, therefore, from Europe, that was the idea, they were inescapable in India and in the Middle East. Neither Indian and Palestine partitions envisaged population exchanges or transfers, so it's very different from the European model. In both cases, the populations were so commingled that exchanges seemed impossible to imagine, at least, or rather especially in the Indian case, despite earlier British plans uh, for partitions in, in Palestine. For that reason, the Pakistan representative at the UN was steadfast in insisting that cultural genocide be included in the UN definition of genocide, because this new country, Pakistan, was vitally concerned with South Asian Muslims who would remain in India after the planned partition. Instead of transfers, India and Pakistan elites subscribed to what was called the hostage theory, which was a, a logic of deterrence and retaliation whereby the benign treatment of one's own minority in the other country was guaranteed by the presence of their minority in one's own country. So if they treated our people badly, it was implied, we would take it out on their people in our midst. Whatever its merits, the hostage theory had no standing in international law, and partition violence, which a number of historians now think exhibited genocidal dimensions, did not register at the UN when Pakistan accused India of genocide, which it did at the end of 1947 and in 1948. The new standard of civilization excluded forced population movements and minority protection, after all. In 1950, the two countries formally committed themselves to protect religious minorities by granting equal citizenship to all. But no one was prosecuted for the countless crimes 
of partition violence in, in the Punjab. What about Palestine? The great powers' inclination to change borders, which we saw in Europe in 1944, Potsdam and Yalta, persisted after the war despite the UN's commitment to border security. They didn't want to change borders after Yalta and Potsdam. Instead, in 1947, the UN Special Committee on Palestine determined to partition the British mandate after the British, who were worn down by the Zionist insurgency and financially vulnerable after the World War, had referred the matter to the UN. The committee's majority report, which awarded, awarded the majority of the country to the Zionists, who constituted only a third of the population, was supported by the General Assembly after considerable arm twisting by the United States, despite the vehement opposition of the majority Arab population. The generous award was designed for future population growth, after all, whose immediate source were Jewish displaced persons languishing in camps in Germany. Refugee pressures that Europe, the US, Canada, Australia were unwilling to accommodate in their own countries were transferred to the Middle East. Now, having just agreed to partition in South Asia, both Pakistan and India opposed it in Palestine. India was, in fact, a member of the UN committee that agreed, and, but with Iran and Yugoslavia submitted a minority report supporting a federalization of Palestine, which was incidentally a solution that the majority Indian uh, Congress party had rejected for itself in India because it wanted a strong central state which would have been threatened by the Muslim League's call for a decentralized federation to guarantee uh, Muslim uh, autonomy. Now, Pakistan, which led the UN subcommittee to st study the Arab proposal for a united Palestine, joined other Islamic countries in contesting partition and failing that, seeking to limit uh, Jewish control to the small amount of Jewish-owned land, which was 6% uh, instead of the awarded 55%. But how to avoid the implication of hypocrisy by denying Jews national sovereignty when the Muslim League had argued that Muslims constituted a distinct nationality? That's uh, Jinnah's two nations theory in South Asia, and therefore deserved their own state. Do you follow the logic? So the Pakistan says that Jews can't have their own state in Palestine, even though we are a separate nation within India and deserve our own state. I mean, people have pointed that out as somewhat hypocritical. But the, the, there was a difference, the Pakistan representative who was alive to this uh, impression, he said at the UN, he said, the difference was that in India, both sides had consented to partition. Secondly, that Muslims were part of India in an integral way that could not be said of Jews in Palestine, most of whom had arrived in recent years and thereby artificially created a nationality conflict. And thirdly, that Muslims in India only claimed majority population areas, whereas in Palestine there were a minority in virtually all the land that was being given to them by the UN. Besides, he added, would the Americans take refugees just because uh, they wanted to come to the United States? What if, for example, the five million uh, Punjabi Muslims now in Pakistan wanted to go to America? Now, the relevance of that is that the UN um, or the US representative said, well, the DPs in Germany want to go to Palestine. They, they should be let to go to Palestine. That's where they want to go. And he said, since when has refugee reference, uh, preference decided this? What if the five million Punjabis want to go to America? Um, to that, there was no American answer. Now, distinguished in this way, India and Pakistan could oppose the partition of Palestine, but reluctantly support the partitions of the Muslim majority provinces of Punjab and Bengal, East Bengal. Uh, so this is the, the Punjab area here in the light green, um, which was partitioned. Well, actually the brown and the green. Uh, and this is um, East Pakistan and now Bangladesh. And we'll talk, this will be relevant, this map, uh, shortly. But was partition really separating peoples or postulating their existence? I begin with India, and I'm now going to run through India, Pakistan, and East Pakistan, Bangladesh, and then conclude. As might seem obvious in retrospect, realizing the national dream was complicated by the messy reality of imposing order on the region's demographic complexity. Take the case of one of the princely states that covered about a third of India's land mass. Hyderabad was ruled by a Muslim Nizam who decided against accession to India in 1947 despite his territory's majority Hindu population. The Congress party predictably campaigned for union, 
though not the main Dalit, untouchable parties, which did not relish domination by higher caste Hindus in a united India. A Muslim party supported by Razakar paramilitaries advocated Pakistan's course and violently suppressed dissent within Hyderabad. On the pretext of imposing order, India invaded in September 1948 and then had to decide upon the citizenship of the polyglot population, which included thousands of Muslims of Arab and Afghan descent who had lived there for generations, as well as some freedom fighters who'd been imported for the struggle in 1947. 17,000 civilians were promptly interned by the Indian Army for supposedly supporting the Razakars, the paramilitaries, which in practice meant in, in, interning thousands of Muslims um, as a whole, just irrespective of what they'd done. Because they were in legal limbo, no longer British protected persons, nor Indian citizens, the Indian majority, rather the Indian military authorities, applied culturally determined criteria about who was to be expelled or not. The Afghan and Arab communities as a whole were deemed to be non-Indian and culturally dangerous, and they were to be deported en masse and as a whole, just like the Germans in Eastern Europe. Now, this seemingly straightforward operation was complicated, however, by the presence of Indians in other countries. The implicit hostage theory applied to them as well, it seemed. The Hindus and Sikhs who had sought refuge in Afghanistan, up there in the top left, during partition would be imperiled if the locals in Afghanistan learned of India's shabby treatment of Ghanis in Hyderabad. More well known in the West was the situation of Indians in South Africa, because um, the country, the last thing, sorry, that Indian, the Indian government want, wanted was their repatriation to India because the uh, South Africans would expel them as, uh, as non-South Africans. The Indians didn't want them because they had sufficient trouble coping with the refugees from partition. Then there was a problem that the deported Afghans may fight on Pakistan's side in the unfolding Kashmir conflict, as you can see there in the north. So in the end, only a handful of these 17,000 interned Afghanis and Arabs, who had been living there for a long time and considered themselves part of the fabric of Hyderabad, were compelled to leave. So making a people was not a straightforward proposition when nationality questions could not be contained in the bounded spaces of a state. Now, as might be expected, the immediate aftermath of partition and the assumptions of the two-nation theory imperiled the status of Muslims who remained as 10% of India's population. Hindu politicians and journalists constantly challenged and questioned their loyalty, despite the country's ostensible commitment to secular democracy. As Sky Nandra Pandey has shown, the dominant assumption, this is now in the 50s in particular, was that the natural uh, or core Indian subject was a Hindu. And that, of course, that presumption continues. Yet despite the fact that Muslims were communities on trial, as he puts it, the official secularism was and is experienced by Hindu nationalists as an intolerable concession to Hindus, uh, to Muslims. Indeed, as an obstacle to the realization of authentic Hindu civilization, thereby mirroring the Muslim League's two-nation rhetoric that postulated fundamental civilizational differences between the two religious formations. Attempts to homogenize the country, like the imposition of Hindi as a national language in the early 50s, founded on the opposition of the regions, especially in Tamil Nadu, whose language is unrelated to Hindi. That Nehru's vision of a centralized and modernizing state was unrealizable has been shown by repeated regional independence insurgencies, like in Kashmir, uh, the Sikhs in Punjab in particular, and in Assam and Nagaland in the Far East. Time? We're running out of time? Okay. Well, it went on longer than expected. Um, I will just um, quickly run through orally the, the grain points, which is that um, you've had independence and, and autonomy insurgencies in all these states, particularly in Pakistan, in uh, Baluchistan, in Sindh, which felt uh, Sindh, uh, which isn't on the map there, but it's, uh, it's sort of more or less in the middle coastal region of West Pakistan, um, where the local uh, uh, Sin population, which speaks its own uh, language, has felt overwhelmed by the East, in by the Indian Muslim refugees who are called Majiyas, who've overwhelmed them and speak Punjab, a, a separate 
uh, well, Udu actually, but a separate, regarded as a separate ethnicity. And this way undermined the very proposition of a united Pakistan ethnicity and nationality. Biharis, uh, who are an Urdu-speaking minor uh, Muslim minority in India, end up in East Pakistan, um, the green part on the right, where they're regarded by the Bengali Muslims as a, uh, a foreign import from India because they're not ethnically Bengali, speak Urdu rather than Bengali. And during the 1971 independence war, which was extremely bloody, were uh, massacred en masse by Muslim Bengalis for supporting the uh, united Pakistan position. They uh, were then repatriated to West Pakistan, where they've never been, um, because Biharis are from central India, and are regarded there then as an alien uh, members of uh, Pakistan. So it underlines, once again, the fantasized nature of these national ideals. So I'll just, uh, I'll go into detail with some statistics on these things. I'll just finish now with a conclusion. Is that okay? Just a couple of pages. The origin and language, um, the origin, um, the issue of origin and language bedeviled the West Pakistan relationship with the Eastern Wing. No, that's not, the, that's East Pakistan, sorry. Allow me to conclude with some general remarks that tie other, these South Asian cases to the other partitions of the 1940s, Germany and Palestine. And I'll just list them. First, there is a question of the imagined community that was partitioned. Why were the German borders of 1937 taken as the natural unit that was in part annexed by Poland and Russia, and then divided into four zones of occupation? What's natural about it? Likewise with Palestine. For revisionist Zionists, it was partitioned already in 1922 and 23, when the British lopped off its large eastern wing across the Jordan and called it Transjordan. For their part, many Palestinians had expected to be incorporated into a greater Syrian Arab homeland. It was a struggle with the Zionist colonization that fixated their cartographic gaze onto the British drawn borders as the natural homeland. The so-called two-state solution discussion today, which is the attempt to finally enforce a partition, reshuffles the deck yet again as Palestinians are invited, or rather induced, to accept the West Bank and Gaza as a mini Palestine. For many Israelis, however, this would represent yet another partition of their historic Jewish homeland, Eretz Israel, and is therefore unacceptable. They want both sides. Um, they want the West Bank and Israel proper. And they entreat yet more transfers for Palestinians to Jordan. Second, the issue of lost women and children during uh, wartime and partition violence bears in, on important ways on the making of peoples. As Tara Zara has shown, non-German children abducted by the Nazis became the object of intense policy and welfare activism by children to advocacy groups after the war. Almost without fail, they advocated the repatriation of children even if they were happily living with German families. And the parents had been killed. A religious nationalist logic was also at work at the same time in the Indian partition during which up to 50,000 women were thought to have been abducted or gone missing, often euphemisms for terrible sexual violence. Both governments cooperated, India and Pakistan, for a decade to locate and repatriate the women who were often adopted into the families of abductors, having born children by the time the investigation teams came knocking at the door. Many resisted the state's claim to their body, which was so symbolic symbolically freighted with notions of national honor and purity. For they knew, the women knew that they would be banished by their original families because they were now dishonored and contaminated by intimate contact with the other. Third, we need to ask after the nature of ethnic cleansing in each of the three partitions and the East Pakistan War of 1971. On first blush, the semi-militarized preemptive cleansing of the East Punjab by Sikhs in 1947 bears comparison with the Zionist forces planned Dalit in March 1948. But unlike the German case, this was not the case of an inter-government agreement. The creation of Palestinian refugees also needs to be brought into relationship with the subsequent expunging of similar numbers of Jews from Arab countries. For the evidence suggests a hostage theory reaction by Arab governments to the Palestinians' plight, even though Israel was happy to welcome them and has been accused of aiding and abetting the exodus in a few cases. The national fantasies of these Arab states now excludes Jews who had been part of their society's fabrics for millennia. Fourth, partitions molecular logics need to be tracked systematically in the citizenship laws of these countries 
and in their treatment of refugees, especially the rights of return and property rights. Fazira Zaminda's work on the India-Pakistan border provides material for such a comparison with Germany and India uh, and Israel. Fifth, the role of refugee elites for the first generation of the first generation in driving the secular national project in Pakistan and Israel against religious nationalism uh, of the religious nationalism of indigenous Muslims and Jews, respectively, needs to be systematically considered. Such an investigation might ask why, in these countries, um, Indian religious nationalism has begun uh, to erode the secular founding ideal in the same way as Jewish religious nationalism. Six, just as important are the stranded non-elite refugees created by partitions molecular logic, namely the Palestinians in refugee camps in Lebanon, for instance, who are definitely not considered assimilable into the Lebanese body politic for the same reason that Biharis remain stranded in Bangladeshi camps. They've been there since 1971. They will upset the ethnic balance in the country by which uh, nationalist ideology, whether pan-Arabism or pan-Islam, they should be welcome. These kinds of questions are as topical as ever in view of the partitions that press upon the international community's attention today, as in Kosovo and Sudan. Not, our, not all our answers, or any of them, will provide the UN with the tidy solutions to the civil wars that rage in such places. Historians need not be policy makers or government advisors. We are interested in the deep structure of these conflicts, how the presumption of, national, of a national self that experiences and drives self-determination and the striving for homogenous and sovereign nation states produces these conflicts in the first place. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dirk. Uh, thank you indeed for this uh, excellent presentation. And uh, I need to apologize because I will leave before the end of the discussion to uh, an executive committee, but I pass very quickly the floor to Alana. Thank you. Thanks very much. And, uh, and thanks very much to Professor Moses for, I think, what was a, a very interesting and very different paper for, um, for this department, certainly in the time that I've been here. I um, haven't learned that much really about India or Pakistan so I think we've all greatly enjoyed the seminar and I think that paper is a good um, is a good project that will hopefully move forward from this um, I think firstly if we start from the beginning and looking at this and I have to say that I having received the paper had to read it four times before I wrote anything because it's extremely detailed and obviously it, it, it is, is uh, based on a large amount of research and it is an excellent job I think in establishing a very good comparative framework on something that really isn't a, an extremely popular topic among contemporary historians. Um, comparative history, yes, but the idea of partition and this link to genocide is something really that I think is new and innovative and very interesting. Um, it, he lays out the questions very clearly at the beginning, which if I'll just, if you'll just bear with me and I'll run through them, which the questions which drive this kind of research project or this interest are, the origins of forced population movements, often called ethnic cleansing, the geopolitical reorganization of the Indian subcontinent and Middle East, the enduring appeal of ethno-nationalist movements and associated political emotions, decolonization and the end of the empire, and the foundation of the post-war human rights regime, which includes the Convention on the Punishment and Prevention of Genocide, basically the nature of international order. So I think from the outset it's very clear this is an extremely ambitious project which raises a lot of very interesting questions but which I felt unfortunately were not really answered by the end of it, despite the fact that it was a short paper. There simply were too many questions to deal with I think from the beginning. Um, also what I found very interesting was that picking the 1940s as a moment to analyse the nature of the international order in the Indian subcontinent and in the Middle East is a good starting point. But I found it problematic that from that beginning there was no reference to the role of the major powers. Now I know you're dealing with kind of India and Pakistan here in East Pakistan, but I would have liked, um, as we had in your presentation, I would have liked in the paper a little bit more reference to what was the international order at the beginning. What was the position of the international, of the major powers and how did this affect the evolution of events and the, um, the imposition of partition and the decision to, to, to divide these countries on that basis. Now, before we go into more detail and, and analysis of the cases, I'd like to talk a little bit more about this kind of theoretical framework that we got and this link that Professor Moses tries to make between genocide and partition. 
Firstly, I think quite rightly he problematizes the concept of genocide and rather in a, um, a nice way to giving us kind of two main reasons why the term, how the term should be, could, should be considered and why it's difficult. So firstly, he says the terms are not natural anyway. And secondly, we just should embrace the normative nature of the term, which is genocide. I think this is um, kind of really a, a, a very interesting uh, discussion that we should have as historians. And indeed, I think this is um, really an expanding field which links quite well with other work that's been done in political science and in law, which questions whether the term genocide is right, when we should use it, and what it gives us in terms of resolving conflicts. And indeed, there's a lot of work going on here in the law department. There's just recently a thesis defended exactly on this topic. So I think it's um, really something that historians should engage with a lot more, and that this is kind of an excellent kind of um, idea. However, I didn't think it was the correct starting point for then making this kind of rather tenuous link to partition. Um, I liked this kind of placing of the idea of key words in, in, in international <coughs> political, in the international political order, like partition, like genocide, and they're placed in this kind of construction of power terms and how that informs our discussion about the evolution of events. But I found the link between the two to be a little bit tenuous. I think the idea of power terms is, is a very good departure, but I didn't really feel that genocide and then what you later talk about is cultural genocide becomes a part of partition or becomes a, a consequence of partition. I thought that whether or not you should link these together a little bit, a little bit more clearly or what I would do is just take the partition as the departure point rather than trying to link it with a huge literature and a huge kind of, as you say quite rightly, problematic and controversial um, history which is surrounding the term genocide in the first place. Um, I think what um, Perez Moses then does in the, in the first, in the rest of the kind of quite long introduction, uh, and very interestingly, and, and yet not very um, typical for a historian, gives us a kind of a good overview of the historical cases of partition and the modern examples. So he takes us from Ireland to Sudan to Inner Mongolia. So this was kind of very, the kind of broadens out the where, from your, where you're taking your, your project and also gives us a nice overview which establishes that this is something which is a, a driving force in history and was something that we should really be looking at a lot more clearly. However, again, I felt this was a little bit problematic in that there were just simply too many examples. Um, as interesting as they were to read about, I would have preferred to have an idea of what was to come and what we could have expected with India, Pakistan and East Pakistan. Rather, I felt that reading your examples, firstly, for me, I would have liked um, more analysis of the reasons behind partition, rather than just what partition was and what its logic was. So the difference between colonial and imposed partition, which is different from the right to self-determination in other cases, and which was kind of, which are two quite different reasons why partition may or may not have taken place within a particular area. And then because there are so many different areas, this was further made a little bit more complex. Um, also, I have to say, I just didn't really agree at all with your casting doubt on Charles Mayer's contention. So I'm just going to, going to quote, the, quote the, the piece here as it is. So Charles Mayer made this contention in the year 2000 that the age of globalization has replaced the age of territoriality, which commenced roughly around 1860 at the end and, and ended in the 1970s. Um, I, I actually would be rather agree, you cast a doubt on it here, but I would rather agree with Charles Mayer for the simple fact that with the dissolution of empires in the last century, the holding of colonies or the exercise of power over dependent states is no longer linked or considered a measurement of international prestige. And rather, although you're you are in fact correct that partition has taken place and does take place increasingly as a solution to um, situations of conflict now. I, th I, I can't really agree with your contention that um, territoriality is, we are now living in an age of territoriality. I think the idea behind what territoriality means in the international order, which is what you're trying to say, is actually closer to Charles Mayer's conception than you um, kind of are ready to admit quite here. Um, the paper then continues to give us quite, again, an unusual, but I find highly enjoyable move for a historical paper, which is an overview of the political science literature, and, um, and quite rightly, the problematizing of the political science literature, which I greatly enjoyed because it's always fun to kind of uh, link, make your paper a little bit in dis interdisciplinary, and then bash the other discipline um, to prove your own point. So I, I would greatly enjoy that. And I think rightly and, and quite predictably, you came to the conclusion that um, the research is flawed because they simply have too many assumptions from the beginning.
um, political scientists. And I, I, I kind of find myself kind of nodding along while I was reading it and um, really kind of enjoying how you draw out the logic of partition and how it works and you provide us with a nice kind of, I wouldn't say neat, but I would say long and very kind of precise definition of what partition actually is. So in doing this overview of the political science literature, you kind of provide us with a landscape of concepts behind the conflicts and you show us how this is linked to what partition actually is and the way in which it, it actually works in each of these cases. So the, the, the definition that you've given us, um, I mean, uh, you can feel free to respond to this. This is how I read it, was um, that you kind of came to some conclusion of how you wanted to conceptualize the idea of partition, which was that it, partitions represent another chapter in the endless process of their reconfiguration and adaption. Rather than engaging in the separation of homogenous peoples, partitions are a modality of their making, however fraught and incomplete, which to me sounds a little bit like political science language, but definitely a historical idea. So I think this works quite well as a, as a kind of theoretical beginning to then kind of going deeper into the case studies. Um, whether or not, um, I think, what, what, we, what we came to after that was why the 1940s teach us something different or something new about partition and the ideas behind it and how the international order was different at that time to what it is now in terms of resolving these conflicts and how these cases relate to each other. I think, again, um, you're quite right in your kind of assumption here or your, your kind of discussion here of the new international order and standards of civilization. Now, I think perhaps this would have been, rather than discussing genocide, I would have liked to see it for a discussion of this, especially since, as you re refer to again and again in your presentation, which was largely absent from your paper, quite surprisingly, was the role of the United Nations in establishing standards of civilization and in enacting um, Kind of policy in different areas, such as partition, on this idea. So there's quite um, a neat discussion in the middle of the paper here about the, the international order and standards of civilization and how these concepts are linked together and how they were then operationalized, if you like, um, by the United Nations in various areas. So I think that this was this is really um, something again which kind of needs a lot of work. I mean, again, at the quite kind of very strongly you've kind of started with um, the League of Nations and um, Woodrow Wilson of course and self-determination continuing as, as a normative language but again I think I would have liked um, really kind of a, a, a closer look at how these ideas inform the international order and if you're talking about the United Nations making decisions about partition which you do here then how they made decisions during the 40s in your case studies and why and how these ideas of standards of um, in civilization actually inform them, just kind of quite clearly. Um, if we move on to the case studies, and unfortunately we only got a brief overview there of the kind of really very, very detailed and complex cases. I think firstly, um, the cases are, are nicely fit together. So um, I think more broadly in your work, you're going to link in some of the European cases, which we had also in the seminar. Now, I think there, were, um, there was a great amount of contention about whether or not European cases can, of partition can be linked to um, cases such as India, Pakistan and East Pakistan. I think there was definitely um, an issue of whether or not Germany is the same is, is, is a similar category than as, as, as the Indian subcontinent. And certainly from my point of view, Northern Ireland is um, slightly a case on its own, um, it being a very different form of partition to the cases that you've outlined here. But I think that the, the, the basis of something kind of a quite strong comparative work um, would be, is established very well here. And the three cases that are dealt with in detail in the paper, India, Pakistan, East Pakistan, you've done like an excellent job in disentangling the complexities of the conflict in each of those reason, regions and offering a kind of a complete picture of ethnic tensions and how the complexity of tensions in these cases gives us a nice kind of, sorry, comparative framework. I'll, I'll, I'll actually write at the end anyway. So another thing that I kind of really enjoyed in the end of the paper, but again, I would have liked in the beginning a little bit more, was this identification of the concepts or features of um, partition and the problems surrounding um, uh, uh, the ethno-nationalistic tensions and qu questions of origin, questions of language, que uh, this tension between regionalism and nationalism. And then towards the end, you've talked about treatment of refugees, um, the citizenship laws in various countries and how this may be um, the features of partition that you could actually use um, for your 
comparison and what property rights that these different groups have on, upon their return. And there's some brilliant examples there of the return to women um, in these um, these countries and how the, there was kind of two very different um, perceptions of what they what they were when they left, what they were when they came back, and what they were there then for therefore entitled to. So I think that again, the, this this framework that you've established is then nicely kind of. Um, beefed up, if you like, with these kind of concepts of how you would actually conduct the comparison. Unfortunately, there was no comparison, and that's my kind of, I think, greatest criticism is that it just the paper, and I know it's a short paper for for a short presentation, but it just kind of ended a little bit abruptly. Whereas I was kind of expecting you to combine these cases at least in um, a, a short way to show us what we can expect from this comparative framework that you've spent so long establishing. So, in conclusion, I think. It raises a lot of questions, and it's, it raises some excellent questions that we should be addressing a lot more as historians, but doesn't really answer concretely anything. There's a good disentanglement and separation of the complexities of the cases that you're dealing with, but you don't actually kind of use the comparative framework that you spend so long establishing. I think the European cases in the broader work may need to be nuanced a little bit, or I mean, maybe even just to simplify, to keep it to one region might actually grant the work a kind of a greater, greater and simpler comparative nature. Um, I think that there is a very interesting breakdown and a very, very good theoretical uh, development of partition. Sure. And um, uh, overall, thanks a lot, Professor Moses. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, thanks to you, Alana, for this uh, very, very good uh, comment and criticism. I will open the floor to two more uh, questions, and then I will give the floor the to... Yeah. to yeah. To Derek, I need to leave, as I told you, but questions, comments, comments on the comments.